Now let's talk about iterative methods. So far we said, okay, let's think about a possible way to solve a system of linear equations. And it was always true that our algorithms, if there were no rounding errors, the results would be perfect. But that's theory. Being a numeric guy, you learn that trying to be perfect always fails. It's only the question, how much do we fail? How much are the rounding errors? And so you learn step by step, it's impossible to get perfect results. And accepting that, accepting that it's impossible to get perfect results, you can forget the exact solutions. Then the next step is, okay, we accept the fact and we don't even try to get perfect results. And that's iterative methods. Iterative methods don't try to get exact results. They accept the fact that we only come into the reach of perfect results. And so that's the idea. Now we will talk about the Gauss-Seidel algorithm. The basic idea of Gauss-Seidel is very simple. The idea is so simple that for me being a student in the first moment, I was not able to take that serious because it's a stupid idea. It's an idea and you think, okay, this can not work. That's impossible. That's an idea of a very, very bad student. So that was my first reaction. And in parts it was true, but in parts it was not true. And that's what we want to talk about. Okay, we have a problem, a system of linear equations given A and given B, and we are looking for the X solving that equation. And now we start with an arbitrary solution. Solution, okay, it's not really a solution. And we say, okay, maybe the solution is all the X's are zero. And then we work with that assumption, which is obviously nonsense, but that is really the assumptions. Let's assume that all the variables are correct. So x2 till xn is exact and only x1 is the variable which is not perfect. This assumption is obviously nonsense, but okay, let's work with that assumption. So only x1 is not correct, but all the others are. So let's take the first equation. That's the first equation. Bring everything to the right hand side with a minus. That's what we have here. And then bring a11 to the right hand side by dividing. And then we have an equation for x1. So x1 is what is here on the right hand side. And then assuming that x2 till xn is correct, then x1 will be also correct. But maybe you will have several questions. Why do we use the equation one? We can also use the other ones. That's true. But we use the equation one to update x1. Okay, if they were correct, then x1 will be also correct after that step. And now, if they were not correct, but almost correct, then x1 will be not too far away from the correct x1. That's the idea why maybe, maybe this idea has a chance to win. Okay, then we accept the fact that x2 is not correct. So thinking about that, I say, okay, if I confess that x2 is not correct, then it was also not correct here when I did that step. So then x1 is also incorrect. So that confused me completely, but maybe you are not confused, that's better. Okay, if only x2 is not correct, we can use the second line. And now we have this equation. These are the indices uh, showing that we are in the second line. And now let's bring everything to the right hand side. 
and that's what we have here. So this one is that one and this block is that block. And then we have a22 times x2. Let's divide by a22. And now we have x2 is equal to that. And now analyzing what do we have here, then we get that we are in the jth equation. Let's take bj, that's here and here. And then let's subtract everything here. It was that block, here it was that block. So it was everything apart from the variable we are dealing with in that step. So we have that we bring everything to the right hand side. This is that and here's the sum. So everything, but not the sum and which belongs to J. And then we divide by A11 or A22. So in general by a J J. Okay. So we run through all the lines starting with one ending with N. And if we are at the end, then let's start over and run again 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 till we have no more differences or small enough differences. So that's our strategy. And in the moment we have a hope, nothing more than a hope. So what will we do next? We will implement that. Then we will check. We will run for several coefficient matrices and then we are analyzing the situation if it works or if it does not work. My expectation being a student was it will never work. But let's see what will happen. So first the implementation. This is very very short given coefficient matrix given right hand side. Now let's find out what's the size of the problem. Let's start with the zero solution x1, x2, xn all are zero. And then let's check how far are we away from the solution. Ax is b is equal to Ax minus b is zero, zero vector. And that's what we can check. And that's what we do here. So let's run through all equations. That was one run. And then we check what is the difference. And if it's too much, then let's run again. And then let's run again. And then let's run again. Okay, that's our loop through all equations. And now update x. That means take the part which is not j, run from one to j minus one, and start again with j plus one and run through the end means take all entries of A in the jth line apart from the jth one. And then we have to do that also. This is clever MATLAB logic. A here, this part of A is a line. This part of X is a column. So multiplying these two, you get a number. And then dividing by A, J, J. And so we can update X. J. So that's our code and now we can check. So let's check how it works and please do all the calculations by your own also so you know if you really understood or if you did not. Okay, let's start with the coefficient matrix 3, 4, 5, 6 and the right hand side 11, 17. Why this right hand side? Because I said, okay, the example should be x1, x2, the correct solution is 1, 2. So I wrote down 3, 4, 5, 6. Then I said, okay, 1, 2 should be the solution. Then I multiplied 1, 2. And then 1 times 3 is 3, 2 times 4 is 8. And sum that we get 11. And in the second line, 5 plus 12 is 17. So we know the correct solution is 1, 2. And now we can study what happens. Let's start with 0, 0. Then we update x1. We start with the assumption that this is 0. So 4 times 0 is a 0. So we have only 3 times x1 is 11 and the x1 
will be 11 divided by 3. So we update our x1, x2 and 11 divided by 3 is a little less than 4, 3.666 and so on. And so our new solution is 3.66660. And let's make clear, that's the x1 and the correct solution is 1. We started with x1 is 0 and then we updated x1 to this number from here to here. So we did not came near to 1, we jumped over 1 and we landed farther away from 1 than we were before. So this seems to become a disaster. Okay, now let's update x2 and what happens here? This is the correct value for x2. We are starting with x2 is 0. So when we update then 17, this 17 minus what we assume to be correct, 5 times x1 and then divide it by 6. And what do we get? The solution is minus 0 0.22. So we are here, we have to find the 2, but instead of going in the direction of 2, we go this step in the wrong direction. So it really seems to be a disaster. Okay, then we had one run is done and let's start again with x1. That's what we do here. Let's take the 11, let's take what we assume to be correct. So it's 4 times minus 0 0.2222 and then divide that by this 3 and we get 3.9. So we go from here to here, we go away from the correct solution. So let's update x2 and let's use the second equation, let's assume x1 to be correct, then 17 minus what we assume what is correct, that's what we have here, divide by 6 and we get minus 0 0.46. So we go once more to the left instead of finding the 2 on the right hand side. So this is really a disaster and this disaster continues. We go even more to the right here and we go even more to the left here. So we will never find our solution 1, 2. So it's a complete catastrophe. After 10 cycles we are at 8.6 instead of 1 and we are at minus 4.4 instead of 2. So starting with that value and it doesn't matter which value do you use there's only one value which is good and this is the solution one two and apart from these starting values it is a disaster and we will always diverge we will always go in the wrong directions and we will never find one two so that's what i've expected this idea is a disaster it's complete bullshit okay normal people will say okay this idea is a disaster let's forget that idea but we are not normal we study a second example and we changed only a little last time we had three four and six five and now we change these two and we change these two okay it's a different system and now again we want to be one two the solution so let's multiply one two and doing so we get 4 plus 6 is 10 and 5 plus 12 is 17. So this is the problem and now we study what happens if we apply the gauss seidel idea. Okay, x1, we start at the position 0 and we want to reach the 1. And for x2, we, st we start at the position 0 and we want to reach 2 and now let's check what happens. Okay, let's update x1, we use the first equation, let's assume x2 is correct. So 10 minus 3 times 0 divided by 4 and that's the update for x1. So we get 2.5. So this is also a disaster 
because we jumped over the solution and where we land this is farther away from the correct one than it was before. So it seems that we are again in a disaster situation. Okay, so let's update x2. Let's use the second equation for that. Let's assume that x1 was correct. So 17 minus 5 times the assumed x1, which is 2.5, and then divide by 6, and then we get 0 0.75. So here we go in the correct direction. We had to go 2 to the right instead of that we go 0 0.75 to the right, but that's at least the correct direction. Okay, then we update x1 using the first equation. We assume that x2 was correct, so we have 10, this 10 minus 3 times x2, x2 is 0 0.75 in the moment, and then divide by 4, and what do we get? 1.9375. So we are going in the direction we should go to, and we come closer to the 1, that's okay. So this is our vector now. After doing so, we use the second equation, we assume x1 to be correct, then we have 17 here, this one minus 5 times the x1, x1 in the moment is that value, okay, and then divide by this 6 and we get 1.2188 and that means we go from here to here, so that's a step in the correct direction and we come closer to 2. And if you want to now, you can update by yourself. I did that 10 times, 10 cycles through both variables. And after 10 cycles, we are very close to the solution. We are here, these are 8 cycles, and we are here after these 8 cycles. So in this situation, our idea seems to work. So that was very surprising for me when I was a student because this really stupid idea, there is at least one system where this idea works. But comparing the effort, how much computation time do we need, it's still very bad if we compare maybe to total pivoting, this would be much faster. It seems that there are at least some situations where this idea can help. Then the third example we want to study is this one. What is the structure of this example? Here we have big numbers and outside the diagonal we have small numbers compared to the elements on the diagonal. That's the situation and these are the situations where GoCycle is okay. Okay, so let's start in the first equation and let's update x1 under the assumption that these were correct. So in the moment 0, 0, then 1.3 minus that times that and then divided by this 2 and then we get 0 0.65. So starting from 0 and we should converge to 1 after one step we are here, that's not too bad. Then let's use the second equation to update x2. Let's assume these were correct, so 9.2 minus x1 times 0 0.2 plus x3 times 1, that's what we have here and then divide by that 3 and we get 3.023. So starting at 0 we should find the 2 as the solution. The first step is here. So more close than it was before, so it's okay. So now let's update x3 using the third equation, assuming that these were correct. So 13 minus x1, x2 times that, that's what we have here, and divide that by 4, and then we get 2.65. So starting at 0, correct solution is 3, 
the first step brought us to here. So this is quite good. And so after one cycle, starting with 0, 0, 0, we are at 0 0.65, 3.02 and 2.65. Not so bad. If we do that 10 cycles, this was one cycle and then second, third, fourth and so on. Then we are very close to one, two, three. The deviation in every coordinate is less than 10 to the power of minus seven. So this time the solution is very, very close to the correct solution. So our idea worked for that example and convergence was fast. And again, what was the structure? We had large elements on the diagonal and not so large small entries outside the diagonal. And our fourth example is the following one. Let's say, okay, two, three, four, five times x1, x2, x3 and x4 is let's say 2, 6, 12, 20. Because we have diagonal structure, it's very easy. x1 is one, x2 is two, x3 is three and x4 is four. That's the correct solution. If we apply Gauss-Seidel, then what will happen? Starting with zero, 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 updating x1 will give us a one here. So the correct answer. Updating x2 in the second equation means that we get x2 is two and doing so x3 is three and x4 is four. So for diagonal coefficient matrices, the gauss seidel will give us the exact solution after one single step. To be honest, having a diagonal coefficient matrix, it's very, very easy to get the exact solution and we do not really need gauss seidel but it shows, okay, diagonal structure is the best one for gauss seidel and close to diagonal is also a very good situation for gauss seidel Okay, so let's summarize. gauss seidel does not work for every coefficient matrix. So that is not really satisfying. But Gauss-Seidel works for diagonal matrices and for matrices which are close to diagonal matrices, what means outside the diagonal small entries and on the diagonal large entries. And the more close the coefficient matrix is to diagonal structure, the better Gauss-Seidel works.